Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. How are we doing, everybody? I hope you're all well. And welcome to another episode of the Believe You Me podcast. But don't worry, it's not just going to be me staring down a lens into your soul for the next 90 minutes. No, Brian will be joining us. Harrington will be here. And we will be joined by today's guest, Dean Amasinga, an old friend of mine, former UFC fighter, and currently a director at the Shanghai Performance Institute. So lots to talk about with him. But I wanted to jump on and make a quick correction. Some of you always ask in the comment section at the start, is this show live? No, it's not live. We record in the mornings, okay? And then Brian does his magic, right? Fixes some audio issues, tries to make it look nice and sexy, and tries to edit out most of the dumb shit that I say. But he's not a miracle worker, so he doesn't edit all the dumb shit out because, as I say, you know, the man can't move mountains after all. Uh, so we recorded the show this morning. We did two hours and then I finish, I walk out, I hassle Rebecca for a coffee and some lunch and a sandwich and all the rest of it. I look at my phone and lo and behold, there it is. Today's show starts with us talking about Benoit Sandini and Dustin Poirier and that fight being off, being cancelled. Apparently they couldn't come to terms, according to ESPN. But in the two hours of the show, the story evolved, it continued to move on and there was progression. And as we know, the fight is now back on. The story or the statement from Dustin Poirier, sorry folks, I jumped the gun. I couldn't get a hold of my manager for a few days. I just spoke with him and Hunter. Misunderstanding on my part. See you March 9th in Miami. So as I say, first and foremost, I'm very excited for that fight. Cannot wait for it. And it's a, an amazing addition to the card. Over five rounds, that's going to be a banger. Now, when the fight was initially off, you had all the journalists coming out. Everyone loves to hate on the UFC and talk shit and all the rest of it. So people People were getting to Twitter, okay, and talking a lot of shit, okay. Dana came out with the receipts, showed text messages back and forth with Benoit Saint-Denis, and then Dustin Poirier just says it there. He says, yeah, listen, the misunderstanding on my part. The fight is on. So anyway, there it is, crisis averted. But more importantly, I had to say this before you all start talking shit, I appreciate every single one of you. If you haven't subscribed and rung the bell, then please do so, okay? But if I didn't do this, you'd be like, what is this shit? What has this been going on about? This is old news. This is out of date. Listen, right? We run a good little show here, but we cannot predict these things, okay? So there it is. There's the correction. But without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the Believe in Me podcast is now officially underway. Brian, roll the tape. Conceive, believe, achieve. Shut the f*** up. <laughs> You're listening to Believe You Me with Michael the Count Bisbing you know my name yet? and Anthony Lionheart Smith. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the Believe You Me podcast, Mike Harrington. How the hell are you, Mike? Dude, I'm doing excellent. How are you, Mr. Bisbing? Well, I'm all right. It's pouring down with rain here, as usual, in California. We've got no roof on. <laughs> I mentioned it off, off air, I think, to you last week. We've got no roof. We've got plastic sheeting, and it is pissing down with rain. Also, I'm a little bit bummed out. I'm a little bit bummed out. Why is that? Dustin Poirier is no longer fighting Benoit Saint-Denis. Literally just before we started, I'm on a group chat with the TNT sports guys. I was like, oh, for crying out loud. Don't get me wrong, UFC 299, should I say. 299, still a tremendous card, but the five-round co-main event, Benoit Saint-Denis, Dustin Poirier, no longer on. Just get the official quote for me in a second, Harrington. I love that fight for many reasons. Benoit Saint-Denis has been incredible so far. That gave him an opportunity to break into the upper echelon of the sport and become potentially, you know, a household name in mixed martial arts, uh, as well as a household name in France. Uh, and for, for Dustin Poirier doing the same thing that Justin Gagey did with Raphael Fazif, you know, stepping up and taking on a young, hungry, up-and-coming contender. And that had all the makings of a ridiculous fight. Um what did what was the official wording on that, Harrington? Uh, yeah, so Brett Akimoto uh, spoke to Dustin Poirier. Uh, he said uh, he expands it on uh, his recent fights off tweet. Um, he said there was no contractual agreement before the fight was announced, and we couldn't come to terms. So, mm. oh, that that is a shame. He wants that Conor McGregor money. I mean, if you fight Connor twice, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you yeah. beat him, you think you might gonna say, deserve it. You beat him two out of three <laughs> times, you know. Uh, that is a shame. That is a shame. Still a brilliant card, though. Who I tell you, who who's really gonna suffer in that one? Sugar Sean O'Malley. I don't think people aren't gonna not buy the pay per view because of that, but 
that's a good fight to have as your supporting act, as your co-main event in your first title defence. I guess Aljamain Sterling will be happy about this. He was bitching, saying that they're stacking it because Sean O'Malley's not as much of a draw. I mean, what is Aljamain Sterling talking about there? But, uh, yeah, man, that's a shame. Yeah, and that's... I don't know, Aljo. Like you, I, like you got pay per view points when you fought Henry Cejudo, TJ Dillashaw, and Sean O'Malley. Tell me, O'Malley wasn't your biggest check? What are we doing? What are we doing? I don't know if he was his biggest check. I think Bet he came you, out. Well, well, well. On paper, on paper, he would be. I would assume that O'Malley's a bigger draw than Cejudo. Who else did he fight? Who else Dillashaw. did he defend? Dillashaw. Yeah, uh, Dillashaw, Fire Island, they're always big ones. So anyway, look, listen, the fight's off, and I'm not trying to talk shit about Aljamain Sterling. Uh, he's probably just having a laugh and talking shit against future opponents, like uh, potential opponents, former opponents, like you do. But the one after that, UFC 299, what comes after that? 300? Jesus, just say 300. Yes, 300. Uh, <laughs> Israel Adesanya is dropping major major, major hints using the 300 logo from the Sparta <laughs> movie. Uh, Israel Adesanya, UFC 300. What did he say? The gods have a way or something? Oh, the gods he must said, be crazy. Which, uh, the, I don't know if you if you know the reference. No. Uh, there, was an, there was an 80s movie uh, where essentially it was like Bushmen in a tribe in Africa uh, had like a, a Coke bottle, like just dropped into their mitts. I guess it was dropped from a plane or something, but it, it made them aware that there was a society outside of like their little tribe. And it leads to a rural Bushman coming to South Africa. Uh, you know, so the, 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 the thought process there is that it is a direct call out saying, I'm going to go to South Africa and take what's mine, the middleweight title. No, please tell me more about this random 80s movie that nobody's seen with this uh, strange Bushman being called upon mm -hmm. the gods. What was the name of the movie, Harrington? The gods must be crazy. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Israel Adesanya basically saying, oh, gee, gee, he could be messing with us, but if we take him at face value. He's going to be fighting on UFC 300. Drinkers Duplessis, Alex Pereira. I mean, I'm sick of having these conversations. The whole world is doing YouTube videos and content creators are going mad and people on Twitter, Chael Sonnen's naming everyone. I said Brock Lesnar and Tom Aspinall. Do you know what I mean? I'm kind of sick of going over this. Dana White just needs to drop the goddamn main event. Even Nina, Nina Drama is threatening to oil Dana up <laughs> uh, if he doesn't drop it today. Israel Adesanya, Drigas Duplessis, or Alex Pereira? What is your pick? Gamble. I think bet, it's prediction between between those three. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Drigas. Like that's the fight that makes the most sense. You have, um, you know, like it, it, it doesn't make sense for him to have lost the 185 pound title, then go up to 205 and cut the line there. It doesn't make sense for Pereira to come down for a non-title fight against Izzy at 185. Um, and and he has the built-in storyline with Drikas. You have a package you can play, and that is like the level of drama that we're talking about for for a potential main event of this caliber. And I tell you what, for all this bitching, because there was some bitching about UFC 300. The fight card is ridiculous. And then you throw Drickus and Izzy on top of that. And before you all start, oh, Bisping there, being the company man. Tell me that's not a sick fight card, right? <laughs> Co-main event, Zhang Wei Li. What else? Just engage you, Max Holloway. Izzy Drickus, Yuri Prohaska, Armand. Alexander Rakic. Who else? Armand Sarukian versus Charles Oliveira. Armand Sarukian, Charles Oliveira. I mean, that is phenomenal. It, it's yeah. it's something quite special. Yeah, I think last anyway. week they said nine former or current champions on the card. So if it's Drikas and Izzy, that's 11 current or former champions on one card. Mm. Insane. You know, I saw Joe Rogan coming out and he it was just a little clip from a podcast. You know, these websites like to do it. Joe Rogan says that he doesn't like the fight uh, of just engaging in Max Holloway. But he didn't say that. He said he loves the fight, but he's not a fan of it for Max Holloway because Holloway... If Taporia beats Volkanovski, there's a very good chance that Holloway will be next up on deck. With a loss to Justin Gagey, it's still possible, although the stock would lower a little bit. Uh, and you've got to think on paper, more than likely, Justin Gagey prevails in that fight. I mean, listen, you can never underestimate Max Holloway. He's got a solid chin. He's never been knocked out. But Gagey's bigger. He hits harder. 
you know, he's a knockout merchant. He's got the better wrestling, you know, and he's just naturally a bigger guy, you know. So you got to go with just, uh, yeah, got to go with Gagey in that one for sure. Yeah, you have to. I mean, I think Max could present some problems with just his strict boxing game, right? Like if he just walks him down with a jab, keeps pressure on him, I could see a world in which he steals, you know, may, maybe three of those rounds and 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 wins a decision, and that then vaults you into a whole new category of stardom at at, at one fifty five. The possibilities are endless, and if he loses. Comes down to 145, gets a win over Yaya Rodriguez, Brian Ortega, anybody in that in anybody in that top five, and you're still right there for a title shot against Ilya Taporia. So, and if he loses, there's absolutely no shame in losing to Justin Gagey. In fact, if anything, he should be respected. Stepping up to 155, it's not like you know when you're a champion and you move up to another weight class and you're trying to become a double champ. Oh, there's nothing to lose there. You know, he's not necessarily doing that. Yeah, okay, there's a BMF title that's legendary. There's only been a couple so far, so that's all well and good. But he's just trying to stay busy. He's just trying to take on the toughest matchups. And as a fighter, former fighter myself. You got to respect that, right? There's, there is some people, Jake Paul would be one of them that are carefully manufacturing their careers. You know what I mean? Picking fights that they know they can win. They are highly strategic. It's almost like they're sitting down, the managers, the agents, like in Rocky, the first Rocky, Apollo Creed, they're sitting down, they're going through all the other contenders, you know, saying this guy, no, not this guy. You know what I mean? They, they, they pick their fights like that. That's Max Holloway just saying, you know what? I'll have a go. He doesn't know he can win. He doesn't know he can get the job done. But he's like, you know what? I'm man enough to give it a try. I've got the balls. I'm willing to put my balls on a plate and let Justin Gagey eat them, okay? Justin Gagey <laughs> might eat Max Holloway's balls. <laughs> no one wants to see that. No man alive should be eating Max Holloway's balls, okay? <laughs> but, he, but he's going to pull them off Max Holloway. This is getting weirder and weirder. What the hell? What am I saying? No, <laughs> no, listen, that's what old jokes aside. That's why you got to respect Max Holloway here. It's just uh, an incredibly brave thing to do, right? And yeah, yeah, no, it's all the respect in the world. And it's like, look, dude, you're one of the best fighters on the planet, like regardless of what I like, you're you should be in the pound for pound list. You, you are that guy, and Max Holloway. If there's no fight for you at 145, take that fight, whoever it's against, to get on UFC 300. Like, that's just that's a cool marquee thing to be a part of. And it's like that yeah. guy does deserve a spot at the table. No, no, for sure, 100%. Um, we have a guest joining us in a little bit, Dean Amasinga, an old friend of mine, former UFC fighter. He was on season nine of The Ultimate Fighter, or season 14. Regardless, he was on one of the seasons that I coached, season nine, I think. Um, former UFC fighter, good friend of mine, big fan of the sport, and he actually is one of the directors of the Shanghai Performance Institute. So it'll be interesting. We'll go through a few stories with him. Obviously, we've got fights this weekend as well to go through, so I'm looking forward to that. 11 weeks in a row now, Harrington, there will be UFC action. Thank God. Praise the Lord. Okay, real things to talk about and delve our teeth into. And then obviously when the fights happen, there's got all the extracurricular stories around them, not just the fights themselves. You know what I mean? We're sitting here scraping the barrel, thinking of things to talk about. I mean, what have we got here? Should we do a quick non-MMA? I'm going to let Brian pick the non-MMA. Don't you ooh. look. Straight away is that, oh, I've got one for you. Brian, you see the notes. You see the notes. Oh, man. Should we talk about a Pennsylvania man who posted a video on YouTube holding up his father's decapitated head. Should we talk you know what? about Mark I don't think Zuckerberg? That's, I don't think that one is uh, going to be safe for our YouTube viewers, but uh, we what, do the, have... The holding up the decapitated head? Yeah, that shit was wild. I thought it was a sketch. I thought it was like a comedy skit at first. One of my co-workers texted it to me and was like, yo, did you see this? And I'm like, no, that's silly. And then like a half hour later, I'm seeing it on the news everywhere. Like, huh, this guy actually cut his dad's head off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I haven't seen, nor do I want to see the actual footage of holding up the head. Did you see that one? Uh-huh. I thought it was a prop. It looked like a prop in a so, plastic bag. It was awful. Let's just give the people some context, seeing as we are talking about this one now. Fine. It'd be kind of weird <laughs> to change subjects. Uh, Harrington, the floor is yours. 
Uh, yeah, so a 35-year-old Pennsylvania man who lived at home with his parents decided that he was the Messiah, uh, the best choice for president, and that his father was a traitor to the country because he had voted for Joe Biden. Uh, so to you know show uh, uh, allegiance to the real America, he cut his dad's head off and then went on a like 20-minute rant uh, on YouTube while holding the head uh, in a bag. It stayed up on YouTube for about six hours, which is kind of frustrating as somebody who has to upload YouTube videos and they get taken down for way less. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I put something up there, right? <laughs> Within seconds, demonetized, all the rest of it. This bastard <laughs> has an argument with his dad, thinks he's the next coming of Jesus, chops his head off, and it's up there for six hours. We get booted within an hour for the slightest copyright infringements. <laughs> we had that thing, what was it, Ric Flair or something, uh, when the line of coke hits and all the two wrestlers. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, they booted that straight off, right? Yeah. So he chops yeah. his, dad, uh, his dad's head off. Uh, you fail to mention that he's a QAnon conspiracy theorist. Oh, yeah, that's right. He spent a little bit too much time on the old 4chan, as we were talking about oh, last week. Oh. Uh, he had he was just spouting all the Q drops uh, like it was, you know, actual news. And and uh, yeah, these were these were true facts. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. That seems like somebody just spent way too much time online and kind of just fell into it. No, no, no. I, and this kind of leads us to. The other thing that's going on right now, Mark Zuckerberg and all the other CEOs of all the social media stuff. I'm sorry. If a man chops off his father's head, thinks that he's the next coming of Jesus or the next president and all the rest of it, that is not spending too much time online. That is the man is absolutely crazy, right? I'm sure my screen time's too much. I'm sure I look at this website too much. I look at YouTube or Twitter or whatever. I don't have the urge to go out there and chop my father's head off at all. <laughs> okay. And, and, and right now in Congress, there's a big hearing with Mark Zuckerberg and he's being forced to apologize to families that have children that sadly have committed suicide, which is, which is obviously awful. And we all, our hearts go out to them, but, I, but, and I don't know enough about it because there's some crazy stuff that is allowed and they need to do a better job and have stricter guidelines. But also I think, I, I, I don't think blaming social media, is all there is to do, right? Uh, I think mental health is certainly a big proponent here. Well, we have a huge problem with a lack of parenting these days. People like to just take their kids and put them in front of the TV or internet and not actually raise their own children. So then you end up with people that do dumb shit like uh, think, think that they're the main character of the universe because the only things that they've ever been exposed to are stories about a main character right so if that's the only thing you've ever been exposed to that's gonna be you if you've never learned a life lesson you're gonna think that the world revolves around you and then it's okay that you cut your dad's head off because he's an evil villain yeah well i don't think anybody i mean even he kind of thought that that was okay i mean what i mean could you imagine it also the, requires the, a screw loose the severe amount of craziness delusioner delusion delusion to chop somebody's head off and hold this is your father your father's head and do a YouTube video holding it up and probably thinking that people are going to be on his side. A thousand going, years ago, he would have just taken his father's kingdom. He would have killed him first. Well, yeah. You cut his head off, you get his stuff. Yeah. Well, no one's cutting anyone's <laughs> heads off other than I might chop Harrington's heads off. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but did you see all that stuff? Brian, I would like to hear your take on this about the, what is it, Mark Zuckerberg apologizing on the Senate floor. Yeah, again, this is like a lack of parenting thing, right? Yeah. Stop blaming Mark Zuckerberg for... Well, don't shake your head at me, bad, bad take, Harrington. Go on. Uh, well, I, I, I took hold. a sip of my honey, water, and lemon, and salt. Natural electrolyte. This is bad. It's a bad parenting thing. It's not Mark Zuckerberg's fault that your kid spends too much time on the internet and gets his self-worth from likes and clicks and all that other shit. You f***ed up. If that's what your kid's life is like, you f***ed it up. I Straight agree. up and down. I agree. Now, listen, as I said before, can they do a better job? You know, can there be better restrictions? Yeah, sure, of course. But you can't put the blame solely on the creators of these social media apps. Now, Harrington, what is your take? I see your face. I see the, the disagreements. I see the, you know, the shite appearing before me, before you even say it. Go ahead. 
<laughs> well, I mean, look, these companies do build AI models of each and every single one of us so that they know the best way to keep us engaged with that platform for the longest possible time, right? We, we they, they literally covered this in the social dilemma, which came out like a, a year before uh, COVID happened, right? And like, these were experts from these companies coming on being like, yeah, we build models to know exactly what is going to keep you locked in and engaged. We're going to, we're going to yep. keep promoting things that, uh, 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 you know, it, increase discourse and get people yep. arguing, give you an emotional response and make this an outsized part of your life, right? Like, so uh, just to keep you watching for another ad for another couple seconds to get their user rates up so they can go to their board of directors and say, we've got 13 year olds spending seven hours a day on this platform where last quarter we only had six and a half. And that yeah. is enough to get your company valuation up 20%. It's still a yeah. failure of parentage. The yes, kids, absolutely. the, the lack of structure and activities in life will cause your kid to be a screen zombie. So unless you have good structure for your offspring, you will raise a shitty being of a human. It's the modern way, right? The algorithms and the phones and the screens, right? You, nobody really watches TV anymore. It's all no. streaming services or your phone or your computer screen, right? All businesses want to be as successful as possible. So that's what they're trying to do. I don't think that they're sitting there, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, some big, crazy, evil person. Oh, you no, know. they probably are. Oh, no, they're probably a bit me mental because once you get to that level of wealth, you know what I mean? You yeah. start getting a few kinks, you know what I mean? But ultimately, I agree with Brian, right? If you're, if you're abandoning and neglecting your child and leaving them in a dark room, in the 80s, Nothing they were called latchkey kids. In the 80s, which, they were watching TV. They were saying, don't get too close to the TV. Your which, eyes are going to go square, right? right? It's business. They're always trying to engage you as much as possible. Now there's this new things or these, these the modern version is the algorithms, you know, right? The algorithms are designed to keep pumping you the next bit of content and your attention span is short. So the next thing, next thing, next thing. That's why they want to do reels and shorts and all the rest of it. So, you, you know, you watch it. Yeah, my son does it. You know, but yeah. after a while, we said, right, no more of that shit. Right, now you're going sparring. We're going taking him kickboxing and all that kind of stuff. Do you know what I mean? It's up to the parent. You can't just abandon them. And listen, that kid obviously clearly had some mental health chemical imbalance for sure. Yeah, beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, there. I, I don't think, you know, if you lined up 100 kids and fed them nothing but social media and, and what's going on in the algorithm, 99 of them are not going to decapitate a family member, right? But when you have this level of accessibility open wide range you are going to bring out some truly mental like you know, the 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 worst mental defects in some of you know the 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 people most susceptible to it in society i don't even i don't even want to mention this because you know we don't want to get thrown off but uh yesterday i was watching on the news and ted cruz senator in texas for those people not in america was uh asking about instagram and if you search for S-E-X with children and stuff like that. It was suggesting stuff. And it comes up with a warning and says, seek help or something or proceed to the content anyway. It doesn't show up with like an immediate flag of, we just, called just, the cops. You're going to jail. Exactly. I'm not going to look that up on my computer, Mike. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Me I neither. don't blame you. I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, not, I'm just in, not. In, in, in that kind of scenario, of course, the, these tech giants need to do more. There need to be some kind of uh, something that kicks in, some an alarm system, certain keywords and phrases or anything that you're kind of looking for. Yeah. Immediately calls the authorities and says, this guy is reported to Big Brother, whatever you want to call it i wouldn't uh, be averse to launching a missile directly at that ip address <laughs> just blow them up so there is a there's a pretty there's a pretty crazy story right now about this girl in uh uh i think it was washington uh who you know she this was from all intents and purposes or, or or you know all measures she was living like a very normal life very happy connected with her family uh she went to bed one night um you know kissed her mom good night uh she woke up uh, the mom wakes up the next morning, goes in her room. Her daughter's phone is on the bed, completely reset, and she's gone. She's been gone for four weeks now, 
right? Everyone is looking for her. There's a massive manhunt. Uh, she spoke to her group of friends. Apparently, she had met some guy online and was talking to him via like Discord or Kick or one of those like, you know, anonymous messaging apps. And the phone was completely wiped by the time the, the mom got there. So there's no trace of her and it's like you could lose your 14 year old kid that quickly in today's day and age and have absolutely no clue yeah and and that is the sad reality of the world i mean jesus christ people are always getting kidnapped and murdered i mean the the evil that humanity is capable it's of almost performing. like there's an elite it's cabal mindless. of people kidnapping children so they can oh, steal their juices Brian, don't get into all that shit stop it stop. and then he signs off then he signs off it is not the liberals and the pedophiles and the satan worshippers it might be we don't know well well it's some sad sick sons of bitches is what it is all right today's episode is sponsored by prize picks the largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform in north america they are the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports it's just you against the numbers okay no more going up against thousands of other players sharks professionals as i say you just pick more or less okay it is that simple and you can 25x your money you can turn ten dollars into 250 dollars with just a few little picks for example this weekend the ufc returns in the main event nazardine imovov is he going to get more or less than 69.5 significant strikes it's a five round fight i'll say more henato moicano in the call main event more or less than 1.5 takedowns that's it that's it oh and themba garimbo friend of the show over or under 24.5 significant strikes i'm gonna say over 24 strikes that's not a lot of strikes listen if you have an opinion then get involved just go to prizepicks.com slash believe and use the code believe for a deposit match of up to one hundred dollars okay it's very very simple it makes the fights more fun and listen even a fool could do it prizepicks.com slash believe use the code believe for a deposit match of up to one hundred dollars anyway i'll tell you what's uh what i could watch for many many hours over and over again and not get bored is this trailer for Tyson Fury and Alexander Usyk. That fight's going down February 17th, right? I was already excited. This will be the first time since, I think it's 1999, that all of the boxing belts have been unified. Last person to do it was Lennox Lewis. I think it's four different titles. Uh, so truly, truly, in terms of boxing, the baddest man on the planet, simple as that, bar none, will be settled once and for all. Brian? Now, how do you ununify the belts once they're put together like that? Uh, That's a good question. I I got it. No, yeah, no, no, I understand. No, no, no. I, I obviously the different organizations. Yeah, but, but do you, you just think say that the belts would all just one, be up? Yeah, you just say in this one, I'm only going to defend the IBO. No, no, no. So you the different organizations mandate different like mandatory next challenger, or you give it up, right? So yeah. like, let's no. say the uh, WP. Okay. okay. No, okay. no, 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 I know that, Harrington, but what, what in my mind is every time that person fights, it should be, and of course it's different organizations and contracts and all the rest of it, but what it should be is that from then on, every time that person fights... That's just a string of belts that gets passed along. There's a string of belts that gets passed that's along, it. but it, but it's not, it's not, and that's kind of the problem with boxing, and that's why this is the first time since 1999 that they've all been on the table at the same time, going to one person, the winner takes all... In a tale as old of time as old as time. I mean, look at this. This is ridiculous. This is one of the best promos I've ever seen. The money that they've spent on this is phenomenal. The production value. They have spent an absolute fortune on this. There's who see. Imagine. Could you imagine being asked to ride a horse for a fight promo? <laughs> yeah. Very easily. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. Look at Tyson. I mean, that's the first time ever I've looked at Tyson Fury and thought, and thought he'd be good in the movies. Old as time. Yeah, that's the classic. Face from the, that's him from the Peaky Blinders. Well, Paul Anderson, he's the man. I would love to see Tyson Fury fight John Wick. I would love to punch you in the face right now. <laughs> what are you talking about? Shut up. No man alive! Both men <laughs> undefeated. Both men 
larger than life itself. It really is phenomenal. So now they go back to the gladiators and they kind of go through under the watchful eye of many different of eras of fighting. There's Fury's wife, Paris. She gets a little cameo. Beyond blood, sweat, and fire. And the mercy of the rough seas. <laughs> Just pirates Ooh, just on the coast the in the old west. Oh, it's amazing. We I guess we're gonna see the rest of it now. I'm gonna say that's enough, but let's see the rest. Well, speak How can you not? Older than words. They will speak loudly. And there is just one way to be remembered. Samurai warriors. Of eternity. Sign me up. I'm coming back. The retirement is over. If that doesn't get you pumped up, nothing will. Why doesn't the UFC get to do promos where, like, <clears throat> like it, they had to get Usyk and Fury together to do this. They seem to, you know, probably had a good time just hanging out and, like, doing the, the film thing. Like, yeah. No, no, no. The, the I feel like the attitude in, in MMA is much more uh, adversarial pre-fight than boxing. It seems no, like the boxing no. dudes are very much like, uh, like, oh yeah, it's just business thing. No, no, far from it. <laughs> it. It all depends on the individual. I mean, if you look sure. at some of the boxers through our history and some of the shit that's gone down. Fair but uh, the UFC have put on loads of great promos. Maybe not to that extent. You know what I mean? Like the one with Conor McGregor and Jose Aldo. That was phenomenal. Oh, right, but that yeah. one there, I mean, that takes the cake. I mean, that is that's almost like a two and a half. That's like the end of a blockbuster movie. I mean, the CGI is phenomenal. I have no idea what that would have cost. I mean, $5 million, something crazy like that, just to promote it. But hey, did the job. I can't wait to see that fight. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely floored. It's like, yo, it's the end of five different movies. So they had pirate ships crashing into each other and samurais fighting. It's, it's yeah, man, they know how to sell a fight in, in Saudi Arabia, for sure. We, they certainly do, and I can't wait for it. What's uh, what have we got to talk about here, Hamilton? Throw a throw an MMA. So, do you know what? We should talk about the fights going down this weekend. Uh, Roman Delidze, Nazardine, Imavov, Hernando Moicano versus Drew Dober. I'm very excited for that one. Moicano, Dober, I love them both. They're both awesome. I just love everything about Moicano. He's hilarious on the microphone, shows up every time when he fights. Uh, I think he's got to be careful on the feet against Drew Dober. Drew Dober is beautiful to watch. Slick boxing, very, very powerful. Probably give Drew Dober uh, the power advantage. But I think if Moicano can mix it up and turn it into, you know, quote unquote, MMA fight, take him down, utilize some of that grappling, those black belt skills, that's going to be his best path to victory. But taking Dober down is not an easy thing. No, but I mean, I do I do see Dober as somebody who likes to like plan his feet and swing with everything that he's got. And Moicano is pretty good at timing a takedown when someone is off balance and over swinging on power shots. And I do think, you know, to, to your point, once it gets to the ground, I don't see how Dober gets back up. Right. Like like yeah. you said, you could have a hard time getting him down, but I don't think Dober's popping up even one time. I think as soon as moicano has got you, he's getting his hooks in and he's getting a choke. Also, we've got Randy Brown, Muslim Salikov. That was supposed to go down, uh, I think, when was that? Supposed to go down Madison Square Garden, was it? And somebody got sick? I yeah, think, anyway, I think it was either. Yeah. Go on. It was right around then because we had Randy on the show uh, yeah, during yeah, exactly. MSG week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good one. Muslim Salikov, Randy Brown, Mokano, Doba, Delidze, Imovov. Great. Starting off a, a nice run. 11 weeks of UFC action. But got a few minutes to kill before Dean Amasinga joins us. Throw a story at me, Harrington. Um, okay. So since you were talking about him uh, a little bit earlier, uh, Aljamain Sterling, 
uh, you know, he, he did. He, he he mocked Sean O'Malley's drawing power and said they're they're stacking 299 for him. But in that same interview, uh, he said his own trip up to uh, uh, 145. Right. He's making a similar jump to Max Holloway, says they offered four names and Qatar was the highest ranked. He said, maybe I'm an idiot for this. Maybe I need to take the Drakkar close route and just go give me the easiest opponent for the most amount of money. That Chael Sonnen route. But I want to fight the biggest and baddest dudes, man. Like at the end of the day, I think that's what matters most. I know if I beat him the way I think I'm capable of doing, I think I'm next in line for a title shot. I don't think that's too far fetched of a thing. I mean, you look at the guys at the top that already fought for the belt. Vol- Volkanovski wins again. It's wide open. Well, I mean, that final point is a good one. If Volkanovski wins again, then of course you're running out of challenges. But Holloway fighting Gagey, Yair Rodriguez, he's beating him. Taporia, if he loses, okay. And then, yeah, Ortega, Evloev, Allen, Emmett, Calvin Cater, Chikadze, Bryce Mitchell. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if he can beat Calvin Cater, who is number eight, it would be a stretch. It would be a jump. And I don't necessarily agree with everything what he says, but if 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 Volk beats Taporia, if Volk beats Taporia, then that makes... Aljamain Sterling's situation way better because now you've got a dominant champion defended about three times at bantamweight and he, he needs fresh meat. He needs fresh challenges. And the reality is Aljamain was massive at 135. I don't know how he ever made it. I don't know how he ever made 135. So 145, could he do better? Could he challenge Volkanovski? More than likely, no. You know, I mean, could, could he show up and have a fight? Of course he could. What are you going to say that Volkanovski uh, can't be Aljamain Sterling and you're going to sit there and pull your face at me like I'm an idiot for suggesting I'm, that. I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying don't tell me Aljamain Sterling can't can't beat Alexander Volkanovsky with his size and the grappling well, that he's well, shown. Well, well, every man is capable of beating another <laughs> one when the, when the ingredients are just perfect, okay? But we're talking about Alexander Volkanovsky is one of the greatest of all time and yeah, he lost to Islam Makachev twice. Other than that, I mean, look at the performances with Max Holloway and all the other people that he's beaten, you know what I mean? And I understand because Holloway, uh, Volk's like a little bit annoyed, you know, because people like yourself, they forget. You know, you go out there, you, you fight someone like Islam Makachev on short notice, two weeks notice. The video, the, the interviews on this channel, he was saying, I was drinking beer and all the rest of it. And he thought, yeah, I'll do it. I'll roll the dice. I'll have a go. Backfired. No shame in that. But you can't then forget about the whole body of work that he has. You know what I mean? And listen, I like Aljamain Sterling and I wish him all the best against Kelvin Cater. And you never know if Bolt beats Taporia, then there's a chance there. But you can't go, ooh. The man that just got knocked out of Sean O'Malley is going to come up and beat the greatest ever. The man that's been dominating everyone at featherweight for ages. Okay. Really? Fair enough. Fair You're going enough. to do that to Volk? <laughs> well, Volk I mean, look, the, the narrative was there heading into the O'Malley fight, right? Aljamain was going to leave one way or another, win or lose. If he won, the plan was to move up and fight Volkanovski for a champion versus champion thing. So it's like, you know, I, I think Volkanovski does look at Aljamain as a, as a real challenge and somebody who he'd welcome to the division. You know, one guy who doesn't respect Alexander Volkanovsky, one guy who shows him absolutely no respect, the, the thinks of him the type of way you were just trying to say, I think of Alexander Volkanovsky. That's that be, his opponent. Uh, yeah. Taporia. <laughs> Ilya Taporia. Uh, he says, I don't have any doubt that the finish will come and it will be one of the easier fights of my career so far. Not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, listen, listen, you got to be confident. You got to believe in yourself. You got to think that you're going to do it. Throw me over to the other side, Brian, please. Uh, you don't have to throw everyone off straight away, but Dean, I'm a singer. What's going on, buddy? Hi, mate. I, <laughs> you said I was in the um, in the background and suddenly ju- ju- jumped onto uh, to you up. I was about to strangle Harrington. That's why. So you came on at the perfect point. <laughs> good to right, see you, buddy. How's things? Yeah, really good, mate. Really good. Just, uh, here in Vegas uh, at the PI, um, got a few guys fighting this weekend from the academy uh, in Shanghai. So yeah, just been here for, for a little while, just getting them acclimatized uh, to the you know jet lag and the time zone differences. Yeah. Right, official introduction time. For yeah. anybody who doesn't know today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm joined by the one and only Dean Amasinger, old <laughs> friend of mine, old student on the Ultimate Fighter. Was it? Yeah. I was just smoking before. Was it season nine or fourteen? Season nine, right? Season nine. Yeah. Season nine on the Ultimate Fighter. 
former UFC fighter, all-round good guy, good drinking partner to have, and <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. You're allowed to have a beer now and again, That's you true. know? Come it's on, true, come true. on. You're not a bloody raving alcoholic, but you have time to hang I out. I am with you. And what's that? I am when I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your official title at the Shanghai uh, PI? Yeah, I'm the technical director uh, of the UFC uh, Performance Institute in Shanghai, which sounds uh, rather fancy. Uh, but yeah, we basically in my role is uh, they ha they made that kind of name up because I, I'm, the, I'm effectively the head coach um, in terms of the technical training and whatnot. Uh, but then I oversee the performance service as well, like strength and conditioning, sports science. Uh, performance, nutrition, all of that stuff. And just, we have obviously department heads and I just make sure everyone's communicating well, working together. And uh, yeah, that's kind of kind of the idea. So you're a big deal out over there in China, basically. That's, that's all it's kind um, of <laughs> Talk to me about, because the Performance Institute in Las Vegas, beautiful place, state-of-the-art yeah. training facility. But from my understanding, the one in Shanghai is like, what, four times as big? Yeah, it, well, actually, bef before we get we get going, so I'll make sure that we have time. I got. To, I want to clear clear the air about something with you uh, because oh um, shit. <laughs> well, because uh, the, I'm not on the in internet very often, but uh, on social media. But the only time my social media has ever blown up is when you've been on um, Rogan, and then right. you and then blamed me for uh, your injury before the GSP fight. It's so, true. Hold on, it is true. Okay, you but, fucking took me down on, like your life depended on it, and oh, fucking yeah. drove your shoulder right, right into my ribs, tore all them totally. So there's there's always two sides of the story, and I want to hear Perillo's version of this as well. But let me set the scene about this camp, right? So. Two people already oh, been sent go ahead. Home. Two two people already been sent home from you from you knocking them out, uh, and but within reason. And it was you're you're on top form, and and uh, that's you know that's fair enough. Part of the, part of the past of professional MMA training is all, all good, and um, and then we're we're getting those sparring rounds, and, and probably across the whole time that we did across camp, I maybe might have got you down two times, and even in, in them times, we probably weren't proper takedowns, like you've got, you managed to get, you know, you, as you do, you get back to your feet. And so obviously I'm there trying to recreate what, you know, GSP does, and I, if I don't go 100% for a takedown, like what, you know, I'm never gonna get you down anyway. You've got, obviously got an amazing, you're, you're a world champion, you've got amazing takedown defense. And when he described it on um, uh, Rogan, it was like, I dug my shoulder in and, I, and, I, and I'm like, and what actually happened, I got you to your butt, and then you like butt scooted away. Like if you imagine, um, on the Tim Kennedy fight, I did that a couple, a couple <laughs> Jesus of times. Christ, you, you, you're picking up loads of shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in terms of the, te your, the technique that you have of, of, uh, uh, of you know, that, that sort of butt scoot to get to the cage, which is what you did. And in that crunching motion, your, 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 um, from my perspective, that it wasn't me driving my shoulder in. It was that motion of like that sort of crunch as you like pull yourself away. Ah. Yeah. And, and, it was and then, my fault. Just just so we know, everyone, everyone yeah. listening, just tell them what day that sparring was on. Yeah, it was the, it was the last, last sparring session. It was the day before I got on the plane to go to New York. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So you could have let your little ego go a little bit, <laughs> couldn't you? No, it wasn't, it wasn't, I was trying to help you, mate. I was trying to help. Uh, <laughs> but the amount of stick I get for that, like little messages on stuff, and I'm just like, oh, mate, I need to let's, let me let me try and clear my name slightly that I'm not a complete prick. In fact, in and, fact, um, I didn't even know we were going to talk about this. You know firsthand how, the extent of that injury. I was not no, myself going into no, that fight. No. Anyway, whatever. We're not here to talk about that. Um, <laughs> we've had some good times. You just yeah, wanted to man. throw me under a bus, didn't you? You've been itching for this. Oh, I've been waiting. Probably ever since I never showed up for your fight, <laughs> season nine of the Ultimate Fighter. Well, you're you're bringing that up. That's a, let's. I'm happy to move on from that. And then to be fair, the other the other one with the um when I when I did your IV uh, after when IVs oh, were God. still IVs were still oh. legal. That's fully true. I, I'll, I'll put my hands up to that. Yeah, I, yeah. I've yeah. only been doing it for a little while. Then I was like not experienced enough, and there was like so everywhere. I panicked. Obviously. I've got to explain this. So yeah. Dean, uh, prior to his position now, was a great coach, coached many great fighters like Ross Pearson, amongst others. Yeah. Uh, Ross was fighting in Australia. I was fighting in Australia. And IVs were allowed back then, you know, to rehydrate afterwards. And I was going to get an IV. I had the bags with me and all the rest of it, but I didn't have somebody to do it, to administer the IV. And Dean's like, I can do it. I've done a course 
I've, I've done a lot of course. I'll do it. And I'm like, oh, sure, yeah, okay. How hard can it be? So Dean comes up to my room. I'm dying. I've just done the wake. Uh, Dean comes in, gets the needles out and everything. Boom, boom, boom. Does something wrong. Burst a vein. Psst. And am I exaggerating? No. It was, blood. It was like, like that. <laughs> a stream of blood about this just coming out of my arm. I'm fighting the next day. I'm like... I don't think this is right, Dean. So no. I, I put my finger on it, it stops. As soon as I move my finger, every time, and the panic on your face. Yeah, uh, I was, yeah, I'm not prepared for this right now. This is yeah, yeah, what yeah. Yeah. I did not they didn't, I, I missed this uh, module. You almost <laughs> murdered the main event. I don't know how you got a job for the UFC. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm uh, in a, a bit of a, uh, be- I learned from that experience and I, I'm in a better, no. better, better situation. We, 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 we've had some good times over the years, mate. Um, so, yeah, the so UFC Shanghai. Shanghai Performance yeah. Institute. Yeah, so... Yeah, how how so, big is that? Yeah, so it's like 93,000 square foot, and um, uh, the Vegas one is 30,000 square foot, roughly. So it's, yeah, basically right. three times the size. Um, and obviously what's different about it is that we have an academy there. Uh, so it's available to uh, all the UFC fighters that are in the APAC, or any, actually any UFC fighter, but obviously it would make more sense for the guys that are in that APAC region to use it. Um, and But, you know, for the past few years, though, because of COVID and how, how restrictive the border has been, it's really only been the Chinese UFC fighters, which there are only about, I think, 12 or, or 14 of them, uh, that can use it the way that the Vegas one's used. And then the other thing is, that, yeah, we have an academy. We have like 30 guys uh, that we recruit from all over China. We have this thing called the uh, MMA Combine or the Academy Combine, which is like the NFL Combine. It's like a combination of like non-technical and technical tests uh, to see their like, uh, you know, fitness and strength and reactions and then technical tests in terms of wrestling, grappling and um uh, striking, and then obviously we look at their fight record, their age, experience, and we look at the you know foot fight footage as well. Um, and we invite like fifty guys uh, and g- girls and guys uh, to this combine, and then thirty get selected to be on like a full scholarship that they live there full time in dormitories like next to the PI. And then we organise all of their training um, in terms of like performance, like strength and conditioning, uh, the weight cuts, nutrition. We have a full sports performance uh, support team as well as technical coaches, and then we get these guys fighting on the regional scene in china but then also like on cage warriors or uae warriors uh to that week though that in between level but before the ufc to get them their um their opportunities and let the matchmakers see the level that they're fighting at um and then the main pathway which is why we're here in vegas is the road to ufc so uh the road to ufc tournament is a a tournament across all of asia and the four weight divisions of flyweight uh bantamweight featherweight and lightweight and they're eight man tournaments and they start in like may this year we had it in 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 shanghai uh then the semi-final was in um singapore when when uh, uh yep. zombie fought yeah zombie fought uh max holloway max. And then the final was supposed to be in Shanghai um, in December, but that event unfortunately got cancelled. And then now the final has been, that card kind of got scattered and people got moved. And then the finals now this, uh, this Saturday after the fight night. So, so do me a favor, Dean. Just scoot over to the side so you're a little bit more in the middle. Sorry, yes, I did. Split the difference. Split the difference. Split the difference. There we go. Boom! Look at that. Look at that. Slap back. I just want to go back to what you were saying before. Then, so essentially. So, so, so for these people, these recruits that want yeah. to get on a scholarship, yeah. which is an incredible thing to have, yeah, um, do they need to have martial arts background, a competitive background? I mean, oh, what, yeah, yeah. what so, is, what is the, the, the bare minimum requirements? Minimum is three, generally three pro fights. Um, but a bit like a bit like TUF kind of thing. But we have made a couple of exceptions for people um, that we see something in them that are there. Uh, like really, there's one guy actually. We went to when we first came. We were traveling around the gyms around China. We went to Beijing uh, to uh, China top team, and uh, there was this one kid there. We were watching them spar and stuff, and someone got him in a sing- uh, um, a single leg, and and he did a backflip to get out of it. And I was like, that or we'll have a look at that kid. And he was 18, but he was in the national team for um, for wrestling, and so we, he hadn't had a pro fight yet. And so he's had all of his fights with us. He's now seven and one. Um, he's had all of his fights with us. What's his name? I think I know who you mean. Daramisi. Or Do- oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Daramisi. He was on the road to, road, road to UFC. So, you know, he's like 20, uh, he was 18 at that time. Um, so we have like, a, you know, we have like a, generally those, those, those younger, uh, those younger fighters, but we kind of, yeah, want a, a minimum of three fights. We have some guys that were super experienced as well, like Shia Lan, who came through. 
and who's now in the UFC. He's, yeah, he's had Nerd and Becky. Yes, yeah. He's had so like I know the names. <laughs> he's had like thirty of um yeah, thirty five fights, I think, when he when he joined when he joined us. And then we tier them. So there's that like tier A, tier B, and tier C. Tier A is like we think they're within a like a year of getting to the UFC. Tier B is like two years, and then C is like a longer term development, like those eighteen year olds that we have uh, that we that we're you know trying to develop. So the, the way that we approach them and, the, and their bonus structure is different, and the like sort of benefits they get, I guess, are different t- depending on the tier they're in, and they like move up the tiers. So like wow. Mahashata, um, who, you, who you should know as well, the lightweight in the yeah. UFC, he joined as a tier C. Had some wins, went up to tier B, and then got his shot as a tier A on on um, contenders, and now he's in the UFC. So he's like a real um, sort of success. Same with the reach along, came joined as a tier B, um, and then went up to A, and then yeah. science. So it's like a, it's just, just just like a you know rugby academy, football academy that they have at United, Manchester United, or something like that. It's like a follow following that model uh, of athlete development and and just try to accelerate the development of Chinese and Asian MMA. It's unbelievable. It it's really cool. is. I mean, yeah, and, and, no, no, it is. I mean, to see, because we talk all the time about how far the sport, sport has come and right. how many people it reaches these days in terms of, you know, the popularity. But to see that kind of structure, and granted, yeah. we don't have that in the UK or even in the States yet. Yeah. Uh, right? I'm correct to say that. No, yeah, not, not not in the moment. Because I mean, knowing I was coming on the podcast, I was just thinking about some stuff, you know, that, that we've experienced over the years. Well, you know, we started training together in 2003 in Nottingham. Uh, with like Dave, in, uh, what's, yeah. what's name, Dave? In, in, in a, a church hall. community center, a church hall. And there, I was thinking about there was, there's like a wooden floor and there wasn't enough mats for everyone to grapple. It was like two judo mats. So like you could have one pair grappling and everybody else doing stand up and we'd rotate round. Yeah, that's right. So like, and that's how we trained. And it was like, and you were it's still, I think you might've been cage warrior champion at that point. I thought maybe just before, <laughs> maybe just before. But that's how, the, you know, and in the first time I had a pro fight, I'd never been in an octagon. That mm. the only, when I walked, you know, no, most gyms didn't have octagon. No, I think like, All Slayer was one of like the first. The, after that, you moved from Nottingham, and, and and they were one of the first to have an actual octagon in. The, and then from that to now, twenty years later, where we've got this ninety-three thousand square foot training facility, the PI here as well, and the, and the facilities that are available, and the team that's you know the support staff, not just the technical coaches. It's just it's mind blowing, mate. It's like it's sometimes no, I think it, of the job that I have and and the opportunity of working with the guys that I work with and stuff. It's, it's amazing. That is phenomenal. And, and as you say, you know, I mean, I look back on those days, though, you know, as you say, these crappy gyms with, you know, leaks in the roof and freezing cold and, and the yeah. toes literally freezing. I look back on that with fond memories, though. You know, oh, I, mean, I, enjo- oh, yeah, man. I enjoyed so, those, those days. Those Rafael's days when it was like me, Paul Daly, uh, Dan Hardy, Andre Winner, Ross Pierce and Nico Shipchett. We, we didn't really have coaches. Bearing in mind, like our generation of fighters... <clears throat> I guess we're slightly different, but basically the same generation of fighters. Our coaches didn't fight MMA. All our coaches were either striking coach, jiu-jitsu coach, wrestling coach, and then they no none of them had, had any of coaches for MMA. No, no. no I yeah. mean, it, it was impossible. If somebody that was kind of one of my coaches, they would be a generation older than me. Exactly. You know what I mean? And so it's, we just got was, in there. It, it wasn't possible. Part. We just spar every day, and we kind of like worked it out. Do you know what I mean? And 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 even you know the path that I've taken to ended up being a coach has, has been a lot because at that time we didn't have coaches, and I just took on that sort of uh, that role. And as you know, in, even at the time when I was fighting, I was still cornering those guys and 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 coaching while I was fighting, which obviously wasn't the best for my um, fighting career. But you know, l- later yeah. I, I acknowledge that um, you know I'm, a, I'm definitely a better coach than I am than, than I was fighting. I was I have a more of an aptitude for coaching, and that's something I'm I'm at peace with, and that's fine. Uh, but yeah, th- those days were like I definitely I still joke when I ch- whenever I catch up with those guys. It's just like they're the best times. Like we just yeah. it, it was amazing. It, Today's episode is sponsored by Chalk.com, that is C-H-O-Q.com, who specialize in men's natural testosterone boosters because men's testosterone is at an all-time low and... You see it all the time, right? Guys with their testosterone dipping, they're still working out. They're not making gains. They haven't got the energy. They're not as virile as they used to be. They haven't got the energy. They feel like less of a man. Well, Chalk has created an all-natural testosterone booster that is going to give you the changes that you are looking for, give you the differences that you need that are going to get you back to being the man that you used to be, okay? Chalk, as I said, all-natural. They're proud to stand above the rest in clean, pure, and healthy products. They use full disclosure labeling so you know exactly what is going into 
each ingredient and they never use proprietary blends. There is no label fluffing or underdosing and all ingredients are measured to exact clinical research. Chalk Daily is the cleanest research-based testosterone booster available on the market. And along with Chuck Daily, be sure to check out their male vitality stack and the stack ultra. Okay. As you're getting older, it's dropping every single year. You've got to stay active. You've got to see, keep moving and you've got to keep boosting that testosterone. And you don't want to be like Vito Belfort. Okay. You don't want to look like a penis with veins, okay? You want to look like the man you used to be or the man that you want to be. And if the testosterone is getting lower, you're going to struggle. So give it a boost and do it the natural way with chalk. Dot com. Go to choq.com, chunk.com. Use the code BISPING at checkout for 35% off your entire order. One more time, chunk.com. The code is BISPING for 35% off the entire order. Obviously, China has got quite the talent pool. 1.6, is it 1.6 billion people? I think it's something like that. Whatever, yeah, whatever it is, 1.2, 1.1, yeah. whatever. We're splitting hairs. It's in the Bs, okay? It's over a billion people. What is, you know, the level of interest from, like, the general public? Are you yeah. swamped? Because I would assume something like that, if you put that in most Western countries... Um, there would be so many people trying to enroll and, and get on a scholarship. How is the yeah. level of interest out there in China? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, good question. So obviously it's changed over the time that we've been there. We've been since we opened in 2019. Um, and when when uh, we were there in 2019, we were definitely not as popular as we are now. And then in 2020, we were like super fortunate that, that um, Wei Li won the title. Yep. She's obviously been a huge uh, sort of uh, ambassador for MMA in, in, in China. But I, I was like trying to look at you know creating well we were looking at creating kpis for the success of the academy and stuff and we had to look at like the size of mma you can use topology and look at the size of mma fighters that come from china and actually the amount of pro fighters in china is less than it is in the uk uh which is surprising considering it's like you know uh, no it makes sense though yeah i understand why and, but, it, but it's growing and the, the thing is though is that um you know the olympics is so important to china uh, and combat sports is big you know they they, they medal in 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 a lot across you know all, all different sports but particularly obviously the uh in, in in the olympics the combat sports as well and they also have sander which is another martial art that's like big big and so we, we're we're actively trying to uh sort of recruit from those uh from those sports and develop them uh, as well but it's, it's a process it's, it's definitely got like we've just signed a no but maybe like two years ago we signed a deal with migu which is effectively like signing with espn but in but in china um and so that's a, that's a big deal that's like representative of like where the sport is going the fact that we're on the major sort of TV network in China now, which is called Migu, uh, and that would that probably was like, no chance of happening that before uh, we we we've started to do you know what we do with the academy and the, the, and the exposure that we get from our academy fighters and this this road to UFC in China is actually like you know pretty popular, um, and we in that combine thing. Uh, that we have we, we do like a live grappling test and a live wrestling test which which you know there's, there's like a hundred thousand people that watch that um in i know that's not massive numbers but for a grappling test as part of a combine no, it's huge it's, yeah it's pretty pretty good that's so that's showing like where the sport is developing and, and and you know that's basically what we're there for we're there to develop chinese mma to grow the sport in china so that it it um you know it becomes more popular and it's a huge market and 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 because they have such a martial arts background we want to tap, tap into that and if we if we let that that happen organically that might take another 10 years where we're trying to accelerate it i'm trying to expedite the process yeah. obviously yeah. um and and I, I, I'm going to hesitate. Well, I'm not going to hesitate. Bollocks to it because, you know, there's always this narrative that I'm pro-UFC. Of course, I'm pro-UFC. I'm very, <laughs> very pro-UFC. But anything yeah. I say, I'm being a company, man. But as you're sitting there saying that, I can't help but what crossed my mind is it's, it's insane because they are literally cultivating and spending a lot of money mm. to, to cultivate this next generation of Chinese mixed martial artists. Yeah. I mean – I don't know how many people that uh, works at that facility. It's a 90,000 square foot facility. That's a lot of money already. Yeah. You've got all the scholarship programs and the road to the yacht's gone and all the rest of it. But then yeah. you've got all people out there talking shit about the UFC. They are literally breeding and growing the sport actively in countries like China where it doesn't exist or didn't exist until very recently. 
Exactly. And then, and the only reason it's only been China for this period is because of COVID. So the first year was supposed to be just China and then COVID hit in 2020 and our borders have been completely shut. So every time you come into China, you have to do two weeks quarantine up until two, January of 2023. I did 19 weeks of uh, quarantine every time I was back in China. About it. Like, and you just sat in a hotel, in a government hotel, you're not allowed to, you, there's like government run, you're not allowed to leave the room. You're there for two weeks. And then one time I had to do 21 days. Um, yeah, but you know, if you get COVID now in the UK, you can still go to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you need so, 19 weeks in quarantine. In quarantine, mate, yeah. So, but so so we only had to have it China, but now this next combine, which is happening in March, we're, uh, we, we're inviting guys from India, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Singapore, and it's supposed to be for the whole of Asia. It's only been China because of, of we couldn't have got the, the athletes in. So they, they, the, the UFC is investing in the whole of Asia to develop the the talent there. Which like, what other sport is 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 doing that? And then there's going to be yeah. Mexico opening in March, and Mexico the same thing is going to be Latin America developing talent in in those areas like Mexico. You know, think about the boxers that have come from Mexico. If we start taking some of those guys, those, those incredible fighters that are out there you know mexicans are known for their fighting spirit mm. um you get some of them transferring over to um M uh, mma we're going to see you know way more mexican champions and then you know abu dhabi's on the line potentially nigeria but like there's there's plans to have a, a pr you've heard you know um dana's talked about it the the, the plan yeah, is yeah. to put because they know that putting these these pis around the world is going to accelerate the development of the sport and we already have champions from like all over the world but that's just like helping in those in those countries that don't have the infrastructure if you think about america we've got the collegiate wrestling system there's there's lots of good gyms and lots of good coaches and you know america doesn't really need the help but brazil mm -hmm. is pretty similar the sport is very established almost maybe you could argue started in brazil you know, the, you know a, lot, huge, lot, a lot of brazilian champions so they're trying to go into the into the territories that don't have um, the infrastructure don't have the coaches and and support and and help them you know make it more of a level play field worldwide so there's more you know worldwide champions it's unbelievable it really is as a guy and as you say you know going back to those early days i mean when i started doing martial arts at the local dojo mm. you know and it was in like the local squash club and you get the mats out at the beginning of the session and then you put the mats away and i'm sure a lot of people uh know what i'm talking about yeah, they used to do the same thing yeah. you know what i mean just put, yeah. putting the mats away and now it's come to this and, and it's on TV every week. It, it is unbelievable. And you sit back and you look at it. Yeah, mind-blowing. Mexico, yeah. Nigeria. Wow. Maybe. Uh, yeah, Abu, Abu Dhabi is on, on, on the cards for sure. Um, and it, and it's just the also the type of training that's going in, into it, what we're trying to do in terms of having like a, you know, interdisciplinary team of having, you know, performance services supporting as well as technical coaches. You know, a lot of the, even when you, even at the higher, even when you were world champion, um, you know, what, you would do certain training in one place and certain training in, in another. Yeah. And, 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 and sometimes maybe all the it coaches. pain in the ass. Yeah, pain in the ass. And then maybe some of the coaches weren't necessarily like on the same page around having high and low days and like periodization and all of that stuff. Whereas we're all in, in house. We've got sports science support talking about training load. We've got SNC making sure they're fitting in the days that I want as a, as a head coach and like just more what other professional sports um, are like. And I think that historically you've had a lot of fighters who, who have come through in the sport who have just like tough fighters and been able to excel. But now you're going to get the athletes coming through that are also fighters mm. and then technically being proficient as well and like bringing all those things together. And you're just going to see the next like. More, like John Jones is an exception, but maybe there are a lot more yeah. things out there that come from other sports that choose to come to MMA. No, of course. I mean, and the, the old um, uh, comparison used to be George St. Pierre, a guy yeah. that started off. Oh, no, not even George St. Pierre, but they always talk about this new generation that the level of the talent's getting better and better yeah. and better. And that's essentially what you're talking about. Yeah. And we do say, we say can you imagine what it's going to be like in 20 years with, with programs like this that are yeah. legit? cultivating them from the grassroots up and it is going to be wild is there any thoughts of like taking on youngsters and children you know that, that show a flair or do you yeah. have to... so what, what you, you know what, like if you you're like a, a young martial arts prodigy and you show an interest in doing that is it is the thoughts about some kind of program not full contact and all the rest of it but having some kind of amateur youth league yeah so one of the things we're trying to do is like we like which we talk about expanding the sphere of influence that we have in in China, uh, because at the moment we've got these academy guys and then if we're not working to develop the guys that we don't have in the academy, like the amateur guys, we're going to run out 
run out of talent um and 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 so on the other end as well so we've we we're do, we've got an athlete coach program so some of the guys that don't quite make it like i don't know if you remember uh jan jafar uh who fought on contenders he was like, older at that point and he and he you know missed the split decision lost the split decision in um, contenders but he was already 30 his opportunity is probably gone now so we put him in an athlete uh, like, you know you know how it works I, I, sorry sorry <laughs> <laughs> I just something popped in my head when you said remember Jan Jafar and I was thinking Road to the Octagon there was that one uh, in Singapore and it, was he smoking a cigarette afterwards or something uh, in in the uh, and he, I think he had a cigarette beforehand because he's from like wherever he was from he was like yes yeah, what I do all the time <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought you were thinking of that guy no 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 it, 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 this guy was on, on contenders uh, like. I can't remember that. I can't remember that. Yeah, a couple of years ago. Anyway, so we, we've like now we're supporting him in developing his coaching uh, as well, so that he we bring him in at periods of time, and there's a few other guys as well, like Willie Jaburin, and put them on coaching, uh, like a coaching development program, fighter development program. So then they can go back to their home gyms and then start developing new talent, and then also like working with the amateur amateur uh, association in China and yeah. having, like workshops and all of that. So that, but with actually coaching and having those younger guys, there's a lot of responsibility to. to in terms of like liability and all of that. So I don't think we're going to go down that route, but we're certainly trying to help uh, the, yeah. like amateur uh, as well as the, you know, the pro guys that we have um, in there. So there's like a long-term legacy effect of, of the, of the program. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Harrington and Brian, let's just see if they're still here or if they've taken an opportunity to go to the bathroom or run away. Oh, here we they are. are. We don't leave. <laughs> Listening intently. Chilling. What do you think of this? Isn't this, it's, 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 Pretty amazing, if you ask me. And I'm not saying sitting here saying that as a man that obviously gets paid by the UFC to hear how, what they're doing here. It's it's phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I, I was I was singing the praises of of you know Road to the UFC heading into this. I think uh, isn't the featherweight guy uh, isn't one of the guys in the featherweight championship? He was like uh, he was in the title uh, last year. Like he, yeah. he could have won a contract against uh, Park, I believe it was. Yeah, no, he, I think his name's uh, Lee. Uh, maybe Park. No, his surname is Lee. Park Jun Lee or something. Yeah, so yeah, we've we've got in this road to FC final, we've got um, across the four weight divisions in the featherweight. We've Just got have a two shot, Brian. I'm going to run the bathroom. You, I'm going to. I'm, I'm. I've been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should we carry on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Give me yeah, your yeah. so so yeah. yeah so I'm actually we, super hyped. I'm going to be watching you yeah, know, for the for the extra three hours. My my be, girl's very about it <laughs> yeah mate we're obviously we're it's a culmination of, of in terms of our kpis and in terms of like what the academy is doing that's really the culmination of it we're trying to get guys into the ufc so um it's a big big night for the whole uh, whole pi and the pi academy but yeah in the featherweight division we've got two guys fighting each other um so we have uh, both of the featherweights are from china one of them's lee Wen and one of them's ija who as you mentioned was on the final of last year i i Pers obviously, I'm the bias, but I personally feel he got a bum deal with that. Um, uh, with the scoring there it was a split decision. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people thought it could have gone could have gone the other way. Uh, also, thought maybe he would have got signed directly then, but he didn't. But he took that really well. Uh, he's been really focused this year, and now he's in the in the final final again and then in the other weight divisions we have a finalist in each of the weight divisions but the bantamweight um uh, fight unfortunately is going to be delayed uh because uh, there was one an injury to one of the fighters so that fight they want to keep it they didn't want to bring in a replacement they wanted to give the finalists a, a, an opportunity so delay that so on on saturday it'll just be the flyweight um final the featherweight final and the lightweight final so yeah well, hopefully we can have three champions on and uh, three champions and three guys signed to the ufc on on saturday That'd be pretty sick. Do you have like guys circled in your mind? Like uh, I think it was Nakamura, uh, the 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 Japanese guy who won flyweight last year. Like he's made some waves since coming to the UFC. Oh, I know the Indian my, dude. My uh, was he banned? Yeah, okay, and then I, I know the Indian dude at lightweight also Actually, lit yeah. somebody up on uh, the the last fight card uh, when Anthony Smith fought Ryan Span. Yeah. I ended up watching that as well. Like, yeah. do you Probably have that, those guys oh. circled as like, oh, these are the regional tough guys that 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 we're looking for in the PI? Yeah, definitely. Well, we we help support the um, the, the matchmakers in terms of like uh, looking at the talent. Obviously, the matchmakers already have an uh, incredibly challenging job just servicing the the roster, which is like what. So, do you know who has a harder job? Who? The commentators announcing these <laughs> names. <laughs> <laughs> They're bloody tricky. Harrington, you can stay on, buddy. You can stay on. In fact, sorry to interrupt. I was dying for the bathroom. I was no trying to find me. a polite time to go. I've got about four receptacles of water here that I've drank <laughs> through. So I apologize, Dino. That was very oh, rude. Yeah. Oh, uh, Brian, uh, 
Maybe you want to join the screen if you can for a second. What's up? Dean lives in China. Shanghai. Talk to me about that, because I'm sure Brian's got some questions. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> I know that it's a communist nightmare if, if you are a citizen there, but I'm, not, I'm sure they treat Dean slightly different. Wow. So, so Dean is not going to say, say that. Because I was going to say, well, he's not going to say that. Uh, well, yeah. My, my experience is of when I've been to China, it, does, it hasn't felt like a communist country to me. You know yeah. what I mean? I see they a lot do that of on purpose. wealthy people and people shopping and enjoying life and all the rest of it. What is it like on a day-to-day -day living your life in China, Dean? Uh, I mean, yeah, Shanghai is probably my favorite city in the world. Um, I've, I've lived in Tokyo. I've lived in Australia, obviously from London. Uh and spent a lot of time in the US as well. I'd, I'd, I'd put Shanghai as number one in terms of like a place to live. Um, it's got like amazing restaurants, loads of nice bars, um, loads, you know, so many things to do. It's a city of 25 million people. Um, so you can imagine there's like a lot of stuff to do. Um, so yeah, day to day in terms of, well, living and, and working at the PI is amazing. It's like coming every day when I come to work, I'm just like, I can't believe I'm here. Um, but like, yeah, living in Shanghai, there's a good expat community, and and yeah, Shanghai is like. I mean, you've been there, uh, Mike. It's like it's a cool city. Like, it's really yeah. not all of China's like that. But my experience yeah. in Shanghai has been super super positive, and and we've got a good network of friends, and yeah, I love it. Uh, particularly the food, like there's like loads of like Michelin star rest restaurants and all, all cuisine from all over the world. Because of which I think Shanghai is in terms of like, I guess the, the financial hub of of. Um, Asia, there's a lot of influence on like French, and, and there was a like French colony and British colony, and there's like French, a lot of French restaurants and stuff in the French concession area, and there's like and and all, even just the food around China. What I, what I was quite ignorant to, my experience of Chinese food is really like Cantonese food, like what we have, at the, you know, the Chinese that we go for, like back at, back at home, right? But in in every every different province has like a different style, like Hunan food, Xinjiang food. Uh, there's like so many different styles of of Chinese food, and I'm like that that uh, yeah, I love it. I love all that spicy food as well and all the different yeah different types. There's, some, there's some interesting cuts of meat and stuff <laughs> yeah 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 no sorry brian the reason i said that is because brian's you know mike's I mean, trying he's... to get me to argue with you about the communism in china <laughs> but like but the cities are different like the cities are very western and like in like uh uh capitalist type cities a type society but like outside in the country is where you get killed for your farm <laughs> He's not allowed to say that. He's there. <laughs> I, don't know you, I, don't know you, I don't know what you want me to say to that. Right. Yeah, can't, no. We can't have this conversation. We're trying to get him killed, Mike? Jesus No, Christ. we're not trying to get him killed. I was pulling everybody's leg and being a little bit silly in the true spirit of the show. No, no, I don't, um, yeah, I just certainly don't want to get into, like, in, in, in the into, politics. Uh, politics. Of I'm not going to get into politics. But, but there's, politics, there's all over. You can, there's, there's pros and cons to every country, like whether it be Western countries and some of the things that are going on sure. worldwide and the, the you know, the, the leg uh, the legacy of colonialism and all that shit. You can, you know what I mean? No, no country's perfect. So I don't really have a position in it. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 I, no, I, enjoy, and I, and I enjoy living in China, like from my personal no, experience. No, of course. And I, um, and I don't expect you to have a position on that either, Dean, yeah. as a resident there. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this. What yeah. is the temperature gauge or the level of excitement for UFC 300 with Zhang Wei Li? fighting Yan Zhaonan, an old Chinese title fight. Is, are you expecting that to have a real big impact on the popularity of the sport out there? hundred percent. The one thing about, you know, like when people say... Uh, you right, want, do you want to just slide me over with... Oh, yeah, there we go. That's better. Yeah. That's better. Um, uh, you know when people say you, you want people to hate you and love you, uh, that's like the most. That's how you get the most amount of exposure as a as a um, you know like someone like Mayweather or whatever. In this fight, uh, I think some people are like, "This is amazing." Two Chinese uh, athletes fighting each other, and then on the other side, people are like, "Oh, it's not good that Chinese uh, are against each other." It, you know, it, it's it's they don't they only want to see Ch some. That means that a Chinese person has to lose. But it's getting in terms of like the social media. Apparently, that there's been a lot of interest in it, and people are super excited. They're either really for it or slightly, I guess, against it. But still in a still in a um, you know a vocal way, which is you know it's already like trending. When it got announced, it was like yeah trending on the Chinese social media and stuff. So it's a huge fight for Chinese MMA, and it's a massive achievement to have two of, of any nation fighting each other apart from America, I guess, because America is you know the, the the dominant nation in the sport. But it's not often you see people outside of America of two of the of the same nation fighting for a title. It's never happened in England. Never mm -hmm. happened. I mean, where else could you think that happened? I guess Brazil. Brazil, Brazil for sure. Yeah, uh, maybe Russia, but um, you know, no. When 
don't know. Well, no, sure. no, I don't think we've had it. I'm saying yeah. you could see that. See it happen. Like, yeah, 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 for sure. For with, sure. with the talent pool, Russia, of course. Brazil, the States, obviously. Yeah, maybe one or two others. Yeah, but um, so it's a big, it's a big moment for Chinese MMA, and you know, it's it's certainly, um, you know, in terms of what they're trying to do in developing the sport in Asia and in China, it's it's a huge moment. And you know, I don't even know if this is a question, but it's just kind of an observation. It seems that the women, and this isn't me being all bloody woke in twenty twenty four, but the women are making a bigger impact in the sport than what the men are. Um. Well, right. I mean, we've got two Chinese ladies competing in a title fight. I can re- reel off two or three other ones that fight in the UFC. But the, yeah. but the men are struggling to kind of make the same impression. Don't get me wrong. There's some tremendous Coming talent that is coming through. through. And, you know, this stuff. The guys coming through. What what I would say about that, which is which is definitely commendable about Chinese um, uh, sport, which I think it, it, it is it comes from their Olympic program. In the Olympics, a gold medal from a woman and a gold medal from a man is the same, right? It's, it's, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. So they so they invest massively in female sport and they value it in the same way. That, uh, that's definitely something I've noticed. Like we have a contract with the Chinese Olympic Committee, and they sometimes send their athletes in to uh, do training camps at RPI. And we've had all different sports like rowing and, and speed skating and, and uh, like loads of different ones. And yeah, they value female sport really highly because of that because of that attitude. So that that tran- that translates to all combat sports as well. So the participation of, of women in combat sport is like really mm. high. So that I think that's that's part of the reason. And and we've got this one girl coming to I remember the name. They get this. She called one song, and she beat Shevchenko in kickboxing. Um, and wow. and yeah, and she jo- she's joined the academy when she was one and zero because um, uh, because of of her record yeah. in kickboxing in pedigree. Yeah, pedigree, and she's now she's now five and zero, and she just beat Wu Yunnan. Do you remember the Chinese fighter? Yeah, female? of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there you go, Wu Yunnan. See, I've heard of Wu these Yunnan. names. Wu That's Wu what I'm saying. I wasn't being. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm a man myself. Do you know what I mean? But I was just saying, as I said, they're making more of an impact in the yeah. UFC so well, far. She's going you know? to be the next one because yeah, Wu Yunnan's now not in the UFC, but they just had a fight in Thailand on. Um, uh, Kunlun fight, which is another, which is actually a Chinese organization, uh, that like when I think Pere- when um, Pereira fought um, Izzy, that was on that organization. Um, yeah, and she just beat her like a real dominant performance. And I think um, next year the Road to UFC might have a female division that hasn't been locked in, but we're hoping. And then she would be in the women's one twenty five. She's a one twenty five er. Um, mate, her striking is like next mm. next level, and she's incredibly strong, um, and she's like super athletic. So yeah, really excited about her. And then one one song to so look, look look out for it. One song, and one song. you're going to remember that name as well. <laughs> yeah, it's not one spelled song. like that. It's W A N G and then C O N G. But yeah, still have one song. One song. Yeah. Uh, Harrington, throw a mixed martial arts because Dean, whilst being an expert in all things mixed martial arts, weightlifting in particular, as I said. Drinking, Dr- Dean's a good man to hang out. I mean, look at that smile. Right? <laughs> Dean's a good guy. We've had some good nights out that shall remain off the air. I mean, one particularly when we were celebrating your brother's birthday, I believe, in London. <laughs> have, you ever, have, have you ever told that publicly? No, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> it's more a new than it's more a new than me, mate. I yeah, don't know. no, well, I didn't do anything. I just got he said you got beat up off a bunch of doormen. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, Harrington, Harrington, join the show again. Um, throw a little. Uh, in, in fact, Dean. Yeah. If you had to whip Harrington into shape, what would you start with? Because Dean is an expert on nutrition and lifestyle and barbecuing. <laughs> I mean, we've done a lot of training camps when, yeah, when yeah. out in Australia. Dean was the barbecue master, grilling yeah. up the, the kangaroos. You know, I mean, <laughs> uh, Mike Harrington, what would be the first step of advice? In fact, never mind that. I'm joking about Harrington. We always pick on him. <laughs> For anyone out there, because it's January and people fail. Right. Yeah. As a guy that's been around this sport and you are a mm. trainer. Yeah. Anybody that's listening to this right now mm. and they want to get in better shape, they want to live a long, healthier life. Of course, there's lots of things they can start with. But like, what, what, what would be one piece of advice that someone that needs to really try and take stock of their life and make a positive impact? Yeah. Good question. Uh, yeah, it's definitely different for like general population compared to athletes uh, because, um, you know, the, the, the pursuit of, of high performance is not necessarily even conducive to like health. Like the, the what athletes put their body through is not actually, you know, you could view it maybe as healthy. But for your for the, the general public, um, it's, it's all everything's about consistency. So it, everyone has the best intentions, and, they, and then they they go from nothing to training five times a week, and that's just not con- like 
sustainable um, mm-hmm. because we have jobs, we have family, and all. And it's it's about creating consistency both in terms of their training and then their and then their uh, dietary choices. Um, there's a lot of benef- benefits of like intermittent fasting. And they could be debated about like what the um, uh, sort of hormonal benefits are of, of, of that. But just the fact that you're having one less meal a day and as long as you're not like pigging out on those other meals, that can create like, a slight calorie deficit or at least um, like maintenance and, and, and is able to make it like consistent. And then if you're adding some, you know, the odd training, more walking, um, you know, during the week, even it doesn't have to be hard training sessions, like going for a walk every day. Um, steps. Step, yeah, if, if those Dude. are things that are, are are really attainable and and being able to be like consistent, um, you know, getting some and for your heart health, like sauna is really good. Um, I think everyone should be doing sauna if they if they have access to it a sauna or a gym or whatever. It's like really good for your heart health uh, and general. Yeah, the, well, Rebecca's gone step mad. Really, I'm obsessed with getting the ten thousand steps a day in. Uh, it's a, like it's, a, it's an easy way. It's like a, you don't even know you're doing it, but just going for a, and it's nice. You, you know, going for a walk with your wife or whatever in the evening. It's like it's a nice thing to do, I guess. But it's, it's not it's, always it's, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes but, a few little arguments brew along the way, but yeah, yeah but no, no, that, we're, we're obsessed say, with that. The the, the the yeah, the definite the, the advice I would say is about is, is consistency. Something that you can do sustainably for a long period of time and having like a lifestyle change rather than rather than like, yeah, the best training plan in the world. It's like, if you can't stick to it, what's the point in having it? And I was just seeing recently as well, regarding long-term health as well, the deficit of calories is such a big thing. I was watching something recently. It was a documentary actually about living to, what was it called? It's about living to like a hundred or something on yeah. Netflix. And it uh, isolated these four different parts of the world uh, mm. that have blue zones. The blue zones, correct. Yeah. And did you must have saw this? Yeah, there as, as the oh, is that what they call it? Is that the just, term? What they that's use? just the term. That's the term for the ah. yeah, 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 yeah. So they have these blue zones and the things that they all have in common, and ingesting less calories yeah. was a big, big part of it. And of course, ingesting less calories equates to less cancerous or less potential cells in your body because it's all about an overabundance of energy in terms of calories in your body, which, yeah. which encourages the mutation of cells into cancerous exactly. cells. And Yeah, and, and in all like my studies and stuff that they've done, uh, they... they um... I'm, I'm a cancer doctor. <laughs> if you, another way, like, the way I think of it as well with that stuff is like if you, if you think about your body as an engine, um, every time you're consuming food, the, the, the engine is being turned on to, to, to process that, right? And so if you the if if you're doing that less over time, there's more there's more things going on, like free radicals being created or uh, pro- things that potentially cause cancer, pot- pot- particularly in nowadays with some of our food being processed and not being the best like types of food. So if you're you're avoiding that and you're not like making your engine work as much, that's like another analogy to sort of think of it in, in reducing the probability of of, of cancer. And like the, the, that fast that Dana just did. I think I think he did a seventy-two hour fast. Um, he just did one. Yeah, yeah. They, there's a lot. There's there's some strong evidence around that, in like all cause mortality being reduced, cancer being re- uh, um, the chance of cancer being reduced because those those sort of dormant cells that live in your body that aren't really doing a lot, they can then turn on to potentially becoming cancerous cells. So in those moments when your body's like, oh shit, I might die because I'm not eating, it, it cleans that those those cells out. Effect, that's kind of what's going on. Um, and there's some like decent research to say that that's like yeah don't do it every month or anything but maybe like a couple times a year um, it can you can see some real good health benefits from it. Yeah, I did, I did, did 84 hours. I did 84 hours. 84. It felt miserable. Yeah, yeah, but at the end of it, it was like oh okay, like I'm I feel like this is what we're supposed to feel like. I'm not yeah. supposed to feel weighed down constantly with, yeah. with all this garbage in my body. So that was well, it was very nice. And I know um, what's his name. Uh, a caveman guy was the, the one who got done for steroids. What's his name again? Oh, oh, uh, the uh, liver king. Liver king. Liver king. <laughs> I know he, he's obviously got a massive gimmick and whatnot. But like, if you do think about when we were living in those days, we wouldn't have been eating three meals a day. It just wouldn't have been there. Like, we would have gone extended periods of not eating, and our body is is set up to dealing with those times and the way that we like choose substrates as an energy source, etc. Um, yeah, like. It, there's mixing in some fasting is not, yeah, is, is a positive yeah. thing. Sure. Yeah, no, no. I, I try and tell 
uh, Callum all the time. And, and he thinks it's necessarily because, you know, I'm trying to get him to lose weight. Listen, we all want to lose a few pounds and all the yeah. rest of it. But I'm like, these are habits that you need to try and get into long term. I do a pretty good job. Most of the times I don't eat till one or two o'clock in the mm. afternoon, most days, and I only have two meals a day. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 along with that also is one thing that I'm kind of, me and Rebecca are really like looking into lately is that when you retire, because we have in the Western world, we have this uh, format that we work until we're 65 years old. And then yeah. what do we do? We sit yeah. on our asses and essentially wait to die. Do you know what I mean? And then yeah. when you're not active, your mind isn't active, you slowly deteriorate away. So that's why I've talked about it a few times on the podcast. We're trying to find somewhere in one of the the the, the more eastern states, you know, like in North Carolina or somewhere like that, yeah. where we're going to get a big plot of land, like 15 acres, 20 Ooh, acres. Nice. And we're going to have cows and grow our own. Uh, vegetables and our bees and all the rest of it because then that, that will keep us active in yeah. our old age because that's what yeah. we're trying to do. My, my mum's just retired back in back in England, but she's got an allotment and she just spends all day at the allotment and she loves it. And she's like, otherwise, like, what else is she going to be doing? But she's keeping her active, and that I think is like really good for her health. Otherwise, like, what you know, what what are you doing with that time? That like having some sort yeah. of purpose and like working towards something and then getting seeing literally the fruits of your labour. Um, I think is like yeah, real positive. That's a great idea. And, and and I need to have the whole thing filmed when I do it because I am useless at anything. <laughs> so that'll be a killer reality TV show, me on a farm. Uh, Harrington, before all the believers are like, what is this? We're, we're talking about Chinese MMA. Throw a subject at Dean Amasinga. Let's test his MMA knowledge before we let okay, him get so out I thought, here. Okay, so I thought this one was kind of interesting. Uh, Corey Sanhagen. Uh, he was on. He was talking to Errol Hawani. Uh, I think it was yesterday, and he he said about the Umar Narmagomedov fight that was scheduled and then canceled. He said, "There's famous guy leverage. I won't beat around the bush, but there is famous guy leverage. I'm trying to acquire some famous guy leverage. I think maybe I should start hanging out with rappers and making myself look less like a normal guy than I already do. Maybe that'll be my 2024 rebrand. I'll get some face tattoos. I'll cover. I'll color my hair and start hanging out with some rappers. It seems to be the nature of the sport." Is that what Corey Sanhagen's missing? <laughs> Colorful hail, hair and some rapper <laughs> friend. Uh, I mean, look, I, I, in terms of like an individual um, athlete, I don't necessarily want to comment as a UFC uh, sort of member of staff to, uh, around a specific athlete. But what I would say uh, is that, of course, the sport is 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 entertainment as well as, um, as as well as professional sport. That's the you know, it's prize fighting. It's about entertainment. It's selling pay per views. And if if you know. For, for, if we use Mike as an example now as a retired fighter, that he wasn't doing Mike the way you spoke at press conferences. The way that's just the way you are, and the, and being authentic in that way, people liked you or they hated you. But either way, they were watching yeah. uh, watching you wanted to watch uh, to see to see you fight, um, and you've got to play that game a little bit. And, and you know, the, the, the formula is not black and white, like because GSP is pretty, um, you know straight down the line and, and not particularly entertaining, but he, he's himself and he's authentically himself and people like really liked him. And even his style wasn't necessarily, although I think he's technically one of the best ever, uh, you know, his style wasn't that entertaining, but people loved him. So the, there's not an exact formula to it, but you do have to play the game because ultimately, um, you know, that that's what in, that's what's involved in the um, in the sport. The reason I'm I'm looking at my phone here just while you're are you gonna get going in a minute, Dino? I do. Yeah, I've got one. I've got one minute. This this. Well, film. well, that's it. You're not having it. You're not having it. I'm actually kicking you off the show. <laughs> no, okay. There he is the great Dean. Oh, I'm a singer, cool. ladies and gentlemen. We need Harrington back though, Brian, because it'll just be me sitting there <laughs> with uh, a glare. I'm, Dino, thanks for your time, Mate, brother. All you. the best to you guys. Compete next weekend, you, yeah. and awesome, uh, we'll talk soon, Dean. Thanks for Take care. Take care, buddy. Bye bye. Cheers, buddy. Great guy, non Dean for years, years and years and years. Uh, just on the Corey Sandhagen thing, I was just looking this up. Have you seen mm -hmm. the tirade of abuse that Chael Sonnen is going on towards Corey Sandhagen? <laughs> no, it's hilarious, <laughs> right? And there's so many. I'm good. There's like literally so many tweets, one after the other after the other. Uh, I'm trying to find the right one here. It, says, it ain't rocket science or nuclear fission. You've got no friends or allies in the entire division. One day you're going to realize on this, you can bet you don't get what you deserve, son. You get what you get. And that's actually not bad advice. And then he quotes again, the, um, 
the curry stand egg and piece that you're talking about there. And he goes, wah. And he goes, you don't <laughs> improve with age, boy. You ain't French wine. Ain't it? And it ain't like country dancing where you get in line. It's more like rock and roll. Don't let a chance pass. Your jungle Jim Morrison or you're out on your ass is rhyming here. <laughs> He's going on and on and on. He's giving Corey Sandegan a lot of shit for this appearance that he had on the uh, on Ariel's show. Robin Sweet and Low from Starbucks, eating ketchup and rice. To the guy I gave my shot to, bet he's living nice. <laughs> anyway, whatever, you get the <laughs> point of what I'm going on about. <laughs> Chell's not a fan of what he's saying. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, Corey Sandegan's an incredible fighter, and the reality is he got injured in his fight, right? He got injured. So, so he's had a bit of time off. He's going to come back, win one fight, and he'll probably get a shot. In fact, there's a good possibility because he was talking about Umar and Amaga made off, and he doesn't want to fire him again because Umar's pulled out several times. You never know. If Cheeto beats O'Malley, Corey Sandigan Corey could come in and be the next contender, the next guy to fight Cheeto Vera. Do you think that's why Corey Sanhagen was like, nah, forget this Umar and Omega Madoff fight because Cheeto already announced Corey's next for me if and when I win that belt. So it's like, why take a fight and risk when I have a, in my mind, a coin flip chance at, at the next title shot? Potentially. I don't know if Corey's mind operates like that, but if, if number one, you got to say fair play to Cheeto Vera. As we were saying before about Max Holloway going up and fighting Justin Gagey, that's really ballsy and really brave and commendable of Cheeto to say that. And yeah, you're all probably thinking he's my friend, but how can you not look at that? Listen, Corey beat Cheeto. It was a great night at the office. Cheeto couldn't get going. Didn't really have much success. It was a shutout essentially for five rounds. I'm not breaking news by saying that. And, and Cheeto knows that. If he beats Sean O'Malley, He's calling out the guy that just did that to him. I mean, number one, as I say, that's so commendable. Uh, for Corey Sandhagen, I mean, you want to want to be a big, a part of the biggest fights. Why would you want to fight Umar Namagomedov when a guy that he, that you've already beat him, who's on the verge potentially of being a champion, wants to fight you next? I mean, and then on top of that, I, I forget the actual number. He said he's pulled out of four fights or something like that. I don't know how many it is. Yeah, he said he said a few. I can look up his topology page, but I think the point is 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 made where it's like, why lock yourself up in something like that when when the reward just certainly isn't there fighting yeah. the number nine guy in the division? Yeah, yeah. All right. This episode is sponsored by FitBod, which is a revolutionary workout app that if you struggle to get time to go to the gym, if you have plateaued in the gym, if you don't know what to do in the gym or Time is limited, you work strange hours, then FitBot is the smart workout app for you because it creates custom dynamic exercise programs based on your goals, your experience, and your equipment. And it also varies up the routine so you never overtrain. The good thing is, is that there's over 1,400 high definition videos that teaches you perfectly how to do the exercises. So the form is always correct. So you're not gonna go out there and injure yourself. And the best thing is the price. Okay, for less than the cost of one session with a personal trainer, you can get a full year of personalized workouts with FitBod. Fit exercise into your schedule because, listen, whenever you're free, that's when you want to work out. And with the FitBod Smart Workout app and their algorithm, which uses data and analytics to build your best next workout, you can see all your streaks right there. You can see your muscle usage your recovery achievements all right there in the app and you are in control with workouts designed as i say just for you so you get exactly what you need it works on ios and android devices and the app is very very easy to use so sounds great doesn't it well it's going to get even better right now you can get 25 percent off your subscription or you can try the app out for free when you go to fitbod.me slash believe it's a great offer for a fantastic app if you are struggling to find the motivation if you don't know what to do if you can't afford a gym membership if 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 you just if you can't be bothered, you can do this at home. You can do it in your park. You can do it in your garage. You can do it anywhere, or you can do it down at the gym. It will give you a great workout for down at the gym. As I say, 25% off your subscription, or try the app out for free when you go to fitbod.me 
slash believe. Uh, so DC says that Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz 3 would be the biggest money maker to top UFC 300. I agree. Of course it would. That would be the icing on the cake. That would be phenomenal. He also went on, didn't he, to say that Leon Edwards and Bilal Muhammad would not fit the bill. Yeah, he was saying, you know, while it is a great fight uh, to headline something like UFC 300, you need the background, you need the drama, you need bad blood. And neither Leon or Bilal is really bringing that to the table at this point. So as far as like, you know, a, a narrative and a storyline, it's not there for the for the main event of UFC 300. But he didn't disrespect yeah. the fight, but just that spot, not right for it. Yeah, you can't disrespect the fight. I mean, Leon Edwards, I mean, he's really separating himself from the rest of the division now, you know, and, and I've said it before, the only one, and I'm not disrespecting Bilal, but the only one that I can see potentially taking that belt is Shavkat Rachmanov. Oh, did you see that? He's supposedly no. fighting Colby Covington. What? Yeah, yeah, just look that up. Just wow. Google that. Brian, look that up. Uh, that just popped in my head. I saw that somewhere yesterday. Uh, yeah, Colby... Uh, versus Shavka. I, I I don't know if it's it's not announced far from it, but there is a a rumor of it going around. Shavka responds Ooh. to Colby's trash trash talk. No, that was a month ago. No, I just I got sent something. There was some it's something on Twitter. It's a rumored fight. It's a rumored fight. Um, who sent it to me? It, it was just going around on on Twitter. Everyone was talking about it and whatnot. Uh, but if that does get made, that's a tough one for Colby. Yeah, I mean that. I would assume. I would assume Colby would retire before he would fight somebody like Shavkat, right? Like that. Just that goes so against everything that Colby has done for yeah. for his branding to put himself in a position to fight somebody as dangerous as Shavkat. If he takes it, God bless him. Just go back to those, please, Brian. I just want to read those out. Um, let's go back. So, so breaking Colby Covington versus Shavkat Ratmanov in the works for UFC Seattle in June. Colby versus Shavkat again, UFC Seattle, June. Yeah. And this is, this, these are all different, uh, little outlets on Twitter. Of course, nothing official, but multiple sources, but you never know because one person comes out and says something and then they all jump on the bandwagon. What I would say is that they're not doing Colby any favors necessarily there with that one. You know, I mean, Colby coming off, very disappointing fight to Leon. Disappointing fight. Come on. Come on. Everyone knows that. He knows that. And the question is now, and maybe Colby would spit in my face theoretically, figuratively, uh, what I'm about to say. But with him now losing three title fights and being 36, does he Does he still have it? Is it? What I mean is, does he still have it? I mean, does he still have that fire? Does he still have that fire? Because, you know, you can look at those setbacks as motivation for the comeback and say, I'm still going to do this, you know. But then they give him Shavkat Rachmanov, who's arguably the next toughest fight in the whole of the welterweight division. Well, if he can beat Shavkat, why not give him another title shot? I mean, I agree. that's the boogeyman, right? Could you imagine? Could you imagine this shit? It's fucking wild. Could you imagine... If, if if Colby went out and beat Shavkat Rachmanov, <laughs> who's 18 and 0, with 18 finishes, <laughs> who was the next guy in line, you beat the man, you become the man. I wouldn't Colby be mad at that. It's all there. It's all there for the taking. And let me, dude, he has done such a good job of managing his brand to the point where my mom, Right. And my dad, who don't watch MMA at all, they hit me up to be like, can you believe this Colby Covington guy got robbed because he's a Donald Trump fan? Like oh, he's God. going on these Fox News shows and he's telling these these middle aged, these boomers, these these people in the Midwest who don't watch MMA that he was 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 robbed of his title because of his allegiance to Donald Trump. And these people are eating it up. People who've never watched a UFC fight might buy this next pay-per-view to support Colby Covington. He is a master of marketing. He is uh, spreading his QAnon theories, uh, <laughs> his theories to the QAnon massive. You know what I mean? Because you, yeah. you have actually got a good point because the majority of people watching Colby on Fox News have no idea 
what happened in the fight. They don't know that he never showed up. They don't know that he never pushed the pace or wasn't <laughs> aggressive until the final round or whatever, where he had a little bit of success. They just like, oh yeah, that sounds about right. He's getting, he's getting, uh, he's getting. What's the word I'm looking for? He's getting punished. Because he he's a Trump supporter. Well, just and they like will fucking lap that shit up. Yeah, no, just like the left, I talk about all the time. The right has just as much crazy madness around it. Like, <laughs> and their stuff is just fun though. Like, their stuff is like, here's some science fiction for you, like space lasers and like I don't know a bunch of other weird shit, clones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, I'll say this: if Colby takes that fight. Fair play to him, man. Fair play to him. And if Shavkat. One would think he beats Colby based upon that last performance. Shavkat's got to be next. Shavkat has got to be next once Bilal and Leon finally throw down. And I can't wait for that because we can, we, we can, Bilal could stop going on about it for one minute. Yeah. Do you nice. think, do you think that has a place? Like DC was saying, it doesn't belong at the very top of the card. But if Dana was to come out and be like, hey, your main event is Izzy versus DDP and your co main is Bilal versus Leon, plus the BMF title, plus the women's straw weight all China t- championship. We got four belts on the line at UFC 300. I mean, that to me feels like, that's a whole, you know, that it would hold similar weight to like a nonsense, to, to, to like an out of the box thing, like a Brock Lesnar versus Tom Aspinall or, uh, or yeah. even McGregor Diaz three. I'm still waiting yeah, for Brock Lesnar to come back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, look, look, listen. If you compare it to UFC 100, it brought, brought Lesnar and Frank Mir, George St. Pierre, Thiago Alves, me versus Dan Henderson. Who else was on there? What were the other two? They were the three big ones, if you will. And then there was two other fights. Who was it? John Fitch, Paul Thiago. John Fitch, Paolo Tiago. Paolo Tiago. I, I, I know there was one young John Jones fighting a Stephen Bonner on UFC 100. If I do on the prelims. Riley. John Jones Ooh. was backstage. I think might have been in my dressing room. I was like, this little shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he's he's, ne- he's never going to amount to anything. <laughs> When's the last time John Jones fought on an undercard? Is it that? Is it UFC 100? It's got to be. It's gotta <laughs> yeah, be. right. Um, Oh, the the other big one was uh, Sexy Yama versus Alan Belcher. Yeah, yeah, Sexy Yama, Sexy Yama. Well, you know it's time for the end of the show when we're digging up old UFC 100 (laughs) cards. Big thanks to Dean Amasinga. And if you have a question for me, Harrington and Brian, Anthony, send it in to bympod at gmail.com. And if you're listening on Spotify, wherever you find podcasts, make sure to subscribe to the show and you leave us a five-star rating positive review. It helps out on all those platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the channel and you hit that notification bell to find out whenever a new video drops. And if you want to catch over 500 episodes you can't find it anywhere else, completely ad-free and totally uncensored, head to gasdigital.com. Use the promo code BYM. Get a seven-day free trial. Check it over. 20 great shows on the network. Well, oh, hey, Michael Bisbing, we got a question from Connor Cartwright. Oh, this guy. <laughs> so can I have this been How are going on? Anyway, I'm wondering what some of your favourite TV shows are. I like Lost Me, South Park's a good one, and also Power. Have a good old lads. Hey, hey, hey. Favourite <laughs> TV shows. Oh, God, I feel like we've been here. Uh, let me see. Do you know what? Again, um, it's been for the last few weeks now because it's long. We're doing Sopranos again. Ooh. We're doing Sopranos. What else did we do? We watched we watched a film recently. What was it called? Mr. Nowhere. Look, no, Paul Giamatti, he's got a, he's, what's it called? The, the Leftovers. Have you seen that? Oh, the yeah, I think it's called The Holdovers. Oh, The Holdovers. The Holdovers. That was it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I just I, know it's nominated for all the Academy Awards. Larry David said it's his favorite Oscar movie, so I do want to check it out. It's 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 all right. It's all it ended up good. I, put it like this. It's good. Rebecca did toy with the idea of turning it off halfway through. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just a slow burn, but it is very good with tremendous performances. TV shows, I'm waiting for, um, what's it called? House of the Dragon to make its return. Because House yeah. of the Dragon, the Game of Thrones prequel, the first season came out two years ago. And they said the next one's not going to be out for two years, which is this year. Did you watch House of the Dragon, Harrington? I tried the first episode and I just, I couldn't, couldn't get into it. 
It's so good. It's ridiculously <laughs> good. I will say it's better than Game of Thrones. It's fantastic. Wow. That's yeah. that's that's big. So now, all right, now you're giving you're giving a homework assignment to the Harrington household. You're gonna make Alex sit through this after we put the baby to bed for House the next week or so. The dragon is fantastic. Okay, it is. So anyway, sorry, can I count right? I can't really think of any shows because I'm watching Bloody Sopranos. Well, hey, what else we got, <laughs> Brian? All right, we got uh one more high energy question here from Sterling. Oh, what the What's going on, boys? We are back, baby. Sterling from Houston, Texas. I got two quick questions. Mm. First one's for both of you. If you could fight in any era from when the UFC started, Strike Force, Pride, now, whenever, if you could fight or fight in any era, what era would it have been? And second question for both of you as well, what the f does the boy got to do to get you on the podcast, baby boys? I sent you both the DMs. Let's go. How's it feel to be a <laughs> my energy you were not kidding brown thank you for the question uh any era right this is going to sound like a proper wanker thing to say but i would have i wouldn't change my era i would not change my era at all the era that i competed in for me yeah i wouldn't change that because Listen, the sport's big now. There's more money in the sport. And of course, money is a big deciding factor. In the early days, would have been cool, right? But no money, no recognition. People called you cage fighters, no holds barred and all the rest of it. They looked at you a little bit weird. Um, when I came into it, you had superstars like Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz, George St. Pierre, Quinton Rampage Jackson, and all these type of people. The sport was just kind of penetrating into the mainstream. So there was still like a cool vibe to it. You know what I mean? It was still underground. There was still, but it was big enough that you could earn some real money and change your life, which I did. Obviously, I didn't earn money like Chuck Liddell or people like that. You know, Conor McGregor, when he came along, he kind of changed the face of the sport. But, but for, I got in at 2005. I got out at 2018. So, yeah, I liked that era. That's a pretty long era. You got in <laughs> after gloves came in and before calf kicks got there. So, I yes! think you, I think you <laughs> nailed it, dude. No, no, you're absolutely right. I'm still, I say this all the time on commentary. I'm never taking a calf kick and I have no desire. You see DC <laughs> took from uh, Ape Alex P the other day or a couple weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did. Fuck that. Fuck that. So, <laughs> do, you know, do you know what made me think about that as well? Because, uh, you know, like a really good way to take somebody down without having to get your hands dirty. You know, if someone's being a dick, someone's in your face and you're a trained guy, just a good fashioned leg kick, a good old fashioned leg kick because they're not conditioned to it. They will drop on the floor and they will be howling in agony. Okay. So if anyone ever gets in my face and starts talking shit again, right? Like some New Orleans punk bitch, right? They're going to get leg kicked going forward because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not lowering myself to rolling around in the streets with them, but I will leg kick them. Right. But then that got me thinking, I haven't taken a leg kick in quite some time. My, sh and you lose the conditioning. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, I don't think I'd like getting kicked in the leg either you probably wouldn't like kicking somebody in the leg to be honest oh no 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 i still kick the bag my shins oh, are still right. like steel i still got the titanium shin bones all right, right, uh, right. any era brian what would you compete in well like i said you you have the best one you have gloves and it wasn't cash click uh yeah yeah uh calf kicks cash clicks cash clicks i don't know herringbone Bro, if I could pick any time, I would say enter me into next year's uh, Road to the UFC 3 Women's Tournament, and maybe I won't get murdered. Uh, identifies as... I yeah, <laughs> identifies yeah, yeah. as an Asian woman. No. So I was going to ask you, the you first want, thing that popped you, want, you want to come... You just said... <laughs> he identifies as a 145-pound Asian woman, Mike. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's uh, Kayla Harrison's next opponent. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's me. No, she would no, destroy God. me. Oh, oh she's so fucking up bad. Say, what I was going to say when I heard this question was I would assume you would say either Pride's heyday or debut about 
a year before USADA came into effect. Because those are two different, like you always talk about wanting to go to Japan. So I figured that would be, and Pride seemed really cool. But I always wonder what your career would have been like if, you know, you you were just starting to get buzz when everybody started getting tested and it was a level playing field. Because I think at that point, put you at your prime in 2017, 2018, you might hold on to that belt for, you know, for half yeah. a decade. <sighs> I mean, I mean, I find it hard to disagree with you. <laughs> no, no, that's very kind of you to say, Harrington. I appreciate that. But yeah, listen, pride back in the day. Pride back in the day. I mean, that was wild. That was when I first Head started. Stumps. Oh, man, I remember. I'd, I'd never seen MMA before. I just got told about it. There was a way to make money. I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to be a MMA fire. Then I started watching Pride and I thought, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. The huge, massive arenas, the crazy walkouts, the lasers, that woman screaming the names, the fights themselves, Vandalay Silva, Shogun in his prime, Rampage, all those guys, Magera, Fedor, Crow Cop, soccer kicks, foot stomps, <laughs> all the crazy Japanese fighters. I mean, that was amazing. It yeah. was amazing. It really was. It really was. And I guess on that note, that's where we're going to end this episode of the podcast. We'll be back on Monday with a roundup of the weekend's action with, of course, Lionheart Anthony Smith. Enjoy your weekends. See you on Monday.